also of Fresh Energy, the Science Policy Director. And I, we have uh, Sam Grant, who is the Executive Director of Minnesota 350. And we're also here with uh, Joy Anderson, who's a senior staff attorney at the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy. And we're here with Alyssa Joel, the legal director with the Center for Climate Integrity. I think we have almost 100 people here today. Uh, we have you on mute. Uh, our conversation is going to be about the uh, Attorney General Keith Ellison's lawsuit on behalf of the state of Minnesota against the uh, climate polluters uh, ExxonMobil the American Petroleum Institute, and Coke Industries. We're gonna dig a little bit deeper into what's happening here in Minnesota, um, what the legal uh, issues are with this case, and uh, then we're gonna step back from Minnesota and we're gonna take a look at the same issue uh, on a national landscape. So before uh, launching in, uh, we're gonna keep all the presentations tight and keep the, uh, the whole event to end on time. I want to first just acknowledge that uh, Climate Integrity uh, is a national organization who leads on this kind of climate liability, climate litigation, and they brought this concept of fresh energy in the fall of 2018, and uh, Fresh Energy helped put this uh, idea in front of uh, Attorney General Keith Ellison shortly after he was sworn in. Uh, we worked with the University of Minnesota's uh, law school to uh, assemble the legal theories behind this. And we worked, uh, Jay Drake Hamilton uh, led a team of ecologists and economists at the university to assemble what all the climate damages are that Minnesota faces from global warming. And uh, Attorney General Keith Ellison uh, started uh, considering this possibility as early as the fall of 2019. And uh, Attorney uh, Lee Curry on the Attorney General staff and Pete Serto have basically been working on this full time over the last few months. So I um, uh, just wanted to kind of tell you the genesis of this event. So we're gonna keep our presentations uh, down to a total of 30 minutes, dedicating the last 15 minutes to your questions. And Joy will moderate the question and answer. So if you wanna ask a question, you just type it into the chat box at the bottom of your screen and she'll keep track of the questions. So with that, I'm going to uh, ask to be put on mute and I'm gonna turn the uh, microphone over to Jay Drake Hamilton who is gonna talk a little bit uh, uh, about, a little bit about the background of climate change damages to Minnesota. So Jay, please. Thanks to the big interested group on this Zoom. Minnesota is in the midst of a climate change crisis. Warming will continue with devastating economic and public health consequences across the state and in particular will disproportionately impact people living in poverty and people of color. Minnesota has suffered harm due to climate change. First of all, rising temperature. Minnesota is warming rapidly. In Minneapolis and St. Paul, annual average temperature has increased by 3.2 degrees from 1951 to 2012, which was faster than both national and global rates of increase. Minnesota winter temperatures have been warming 13 times faster than summer temperatures. High temperatures can also lead to crop damage. Corn in particular is the number one crop grown in Minnesota and accounts for an estimated $4.6 billion in production value alone. Yet corn can be irreparably damaged when temperatures are at or above 95 degrees Fahrenheit one or more day at a time. For precip precipitation and flooding, annual precipitation between 2000 and 2019 has increased in the range of five to six inches. Some of Minnesota's precipitation events have been like none other than we previously observed. We are in some new territory. Statewide, Minnesota experienced a 42% increase in the heaviest rainfall events, the top 1% between 1901 and 2016. Minnesota has had 10 mega rain events between 2000 and 2016. This has led to increased and more damaging flooding. The 1997 Red River of the North flood in Minnesota was the most severe flood of that river since 1820. 
six, with damages in the region estimated to cost $3.5 billion. The state of Minnesota and communities in Minnesota paid for portion of the damage relief not covered by federal disaster relief. In 2007, Minnesota provided in one year $165 million in disaster relief due to flooding. And yet again, in 2010, the state paid $80 million. And again, in 2012, the state paid another $160 million due to flooding. In infrastructure, Minnesota has aging transportation infrastructure that is further stressed by increases in heavy precipitation events. The expected continued increase will affect access to roads and the viability of bridges in our state. Faster water flow caused by extreme rain can erode the bases of bridges, a condition known as scour. The EPA estimates the annual cost of maintaining current levels of service on Midwestern bridges from climate damage at about $400 million per year, starting in 2050. The expected continued change in rainfall will damage stormwater and sewer systems. Water treatment systems and pumping stations will require upgrades to withstand future conditions. In 2020, Governor Walls requested $293 million in the state bonding bill for water infrastructure upgrades needed because of climate change. Minnesotans who are Black, Indigenous, or people of color are most concerned about climate change because of water damage to their homes, water supply, and drinking water contamination. Now, what about public health? Health impacts of climate change and associated harms and costs include impacts from extreme heat, increased challenges with allergies and pollen, asthma, and vector-borne diseases. Let's drill down for a minute on asthma. Asthma disproportionately impacts children, women, African Americans, and people with low incomes. One in four kids and one in 13 adults currently have asthma. In 2014, asthma cost Minnesota an estimated, get this, 669.3 million dollars in one year. In 2014, um, in 2016, for 18,200 emergency room visits and 1,900 hospitalizations for asthma in Minnesota. In 2017, Minnesota had 55 deaths due to asthma. Climate change is expected to shift the geographic range of disease-carrying insects and pests, exposing more Minnesotans to ticks that carry Lyme disease and mosquitoes that transmit viruses such as West, West Nile virus. Incidents of tick-borne illnesses in Minnesota increased 742% over a 16-year period starting in 1996. So I hope you will join me on a letter I'm bringing directly to the Attorney General next week. And you can help sign that letter. You'll see it appear, a link to it appear in the chat box. Get it to me this week and I'll carry your signature with me to thank Attorney General Ellison. Our next speaker is Sam Grant from MN350. Thank you, Jay. And thank you all for being with us on this call. This is a historic decade in the history, not only of Minnesota, but in the history of the world. Um, I'm calling 2020 our new year zero and the decade of 2020 to 2030 as our new decade zero. It is in this decade that we have to take all measures possible to foster a rapid transition towards a renewable energy society. And so I want to sort of start by going backwards a little bit to 1994, when Attorney General Humphrey 
work with the, the law firm of, of Miller Kaplan Cerisi and Blue Cross Blue Shield to file a lawsuit against Philip Morris and other tobacco companies for gross negligence, false advertising, and tremendous harm to the public. It took four plus years, but that lawsuit settled for $6.5 billion. And about half a million, or a little bit less than half a million of that money went to support local efforts to curb tobacco harm. Um, with investments made into communities most impacted by the disparities caused by tobacco harm. Some of that money was also used by two different governors to deal with state deficits, which was deemed an inappropriate use of the funds and nonetheless executed. Now here we are with a very well-designed lawsuit by Attorney General Ellison to hold three major facilitators of our fossil fuel, account fossil fuel economy to account for the harm they have caused. In 2018, 43 fossil fuel companies had combined income of 28 billion, supported also by subsidies by the United States government of $20 billion. These companies lied to the public, they distorted the science, and they made enormous profits while adding immensely to the racial wealth and well being divides. Oil companies, as engines of the economy, are considerably imbricated in the socially engineered design of environmental injustice over the 20th century and into the 21st century. It is time now that we privilege the right to breathe over the right to burn. Climate justice is a strategy to respond to climate change by coordinating a robust just transition to renewable energy sources and move society to carbon neutrality with deeply embedded racial, gender, and economic justice objectives. How can we imagine that first this lawsuit is successful and that then we wisely invest resources from this lawsuit in a just transitions regenerative investment strategy? To access support from this strategy, you would have to center strategies that close quality of life gaps for BIPOC, LGBTQ women and low wage workers and the unemployed and engage these populations on career and enterprise pathways that not only directly benefit them now, but situate them as our leading facilitators of a deeply democratic, self-determined, equitable, decarbonized future. Here are some ready for the garden initiatives that I'm imagining um, we might propose if we win this settlement, let's say when we win this settlement. Uh, invest directly in BIPOC enterprises in the renewable energy sector, the circular economy sector, the agroecology sector, the healthy housing sector, and the environmental justice sector. Invest directly in community initiatives to self-defined strategies that tangibly reduce environmental justice overburdens, work towards zero residents in poverty, develop an ecological commons in every city, facilitating continuously productive urban landscapes that reduce heat island effects, insect, create insect pollinator, uh, pollinator corridors throughout all communities, increase, increase the range and quality of outdoor spaces for common enjoyment, replace roads for cars with walkways, bike paths, and public transit corridors, prioritize investments in renewable energy in most impacted communities so that what it means to live in a formally poor environmental justice overburdened community in 2020 is that by 2050, you live in a beautiful, safe, healthy, prosperous, local living economy with free energy. A climate reparations community development account would match public and private dollars to support community design solutions to ecological and social regeneration. These are just some of the ideas that are top of mind for me as I think about what's at stake and also what's possible. So I want you all to join with Jay's suggestion that we all sign on to that letter thanking Keith Ellison for this significant and necessary step. And I want us to do all we can as citizens and earthlings to fight hard and wisely for the well-being of the planet and all people. And I thank you for your time. And now I want to pass to my colleague, uh, Joy, who is going to talk to you about uh, some of the nuances of this lawsuit. Joy. Thank you so much, Sam. So I'm Joy Anderson, and I'm a senior staff attorney at Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy. And I'm going to dig in a little bit on the legal issues of this lawsuit. So the focus of the lawsuit is that defendants knew of the dangers of, the, of climate change as early as the 1960s, but they hid this information from the public and made false statements about climate change and its effects. 
they asserted that climate change was unproven or uncertain or that the effects wouldn't be that bad. And at the same time, they funneled hundreds of millions of dollars to groups that denied or undermined climate change and climate science. And this deceptive behavior caused Minnesotans to buy more oil and gas than they would have if they'd known the truth. So I wanna talk briefly about two things, what the claims are in this lawsuit and what remedies the lawsuit is asking for. So first, what the claims are not. This lawsuit is not to prove that defendants caused climate change. And that makes this lawsuit a little bit different from a lot of others that have been going on around the country, as our next panelist will discuss. Instead, this lawsuit focuses on defendants' deception of consumers about climate change. The Attorney General has brought five claims, including a claim for fraud and misrepresentation, and a claim for failure to warn as a manufacturer of a dangerous product. But the three that I think are at the heart of the case and that I would like to talk about today are three claims based on Minnesota's powerful consumer protection statutes. And that's the Minnesota Consumer Fraud Act, the Minnesota Deceptive Trade Practices Act, and the Minnesota False Statement in Advertising Act. These statutes are intended to provide broad protections for the public. They are easier to prove than a general kind of fraud claim that you might bring outside the consumer context. And they give the attorney general powerful tools to right wrongs against consumers. These statutes have slightly different elements based on the language of the statute, but for all three, generally, the attorney general will have to demonstrate that the defendants made false or misleading statements of fact in connection with sales of their products. You also have to show some level of intent, either that the intent was that the defendants had the intent to sell these, their products to customers by making these statements, or that they intended that customers rely on these statements, some level of intent um, around that, that standard, which depends a little bit differently on which statute you're talking about. So now once these claims have been established, what can Minnesotans receive? Under these statutes, the Attorney General can get multiple different remedies, and that's why these statutes, these consumer protection statutes, are so powerful. So let's talk about what the lawsuit asks for. First, it asks for an injunction, which is an order to the defendants to stop all of their false statements and deceptive practices. And if they violate that, they, can be, they will be um, in contempt of court, which is not something that you want to be. That opens up a whole nother box of worms for them. They can also, the court can also order disclosure of documents, order that the defendants release all the documents they have relating to climate change. And this is something that oil companies have fought very hard against in other climate change related litigation. So it seems quite possible that there are other documents out there that still reveal more about what the oil companies knew that they do not want the public to have. The lawsuit also asks for the funding of a corrective public education campaign for Minnesotans about the true effects of climate change. And this is a really interesting idea because the harm to Minnesotans was that Minnesotans believed false things about climate change. To remedy that, the defendants would have to fund an education campaign so that Minnesotans would actually learn about the true effects of climate change. The lawsuit also asks for civil penalties, which are like a fine that is paid to the state for a violation of the law. And these can be very substantial. The law calls for a civil penalty of up to $25,000 for each violation of the law. And a single violation of the law can be a single misrepresentation to a single consumer. And so if you add all those up over the history of time that we are talking about with the climate change denial, that could be an extremely large amount of money. The state's also asking for money damages. They're asking for restitution for harm to the state. And they're also asking for something called disgorgement of profits, which is all the money that the defendants have made based on their violations of the law has to be paid back to the state. So this 
the defendants here should not be able to benefit from the, um, the fraud that they have perpetrated on Minnesotans. And finally, the lawsuit is asking for attorney's fees, which again, this is likely to be a long, hard fought litigation. And I know that the attorney general is gearing up for a long, hard litigation. And if, if they win in the end, they can get attorney's fees paid for all of that time, which again, will be very substantial. The complaint doesn't ask for a specific amount of damages, but Attorney General Ellison has stated in the media, uh, he's agreed that it could be within the ballpark of what the tobacco litigation was, which as Sam mentioned was about $6.5 billion. So that's a little bit about our lawsuit and how it's going to work. Next, I'm going to hand things over to Alyssa Joel from CCI, who is going to talk about how this fits in with climate change litigation around the country. Thanks, Joy, and thanks to all who organized this. It's a pleasure to be here with you today, and, and congratulations on this tremendous success. Um, as, as Joy mentioned, I wanted to sort of position this lawsuit and in, in the broader national landscape where this fits in in national climate accountability efforts. And while the Minnesota lawsuit is certainly unique, it's not the first of these suits that has been brought. There are now 18 lawsuits total that fit into this broad category of climate accountability lawsuits, uh, from California to Colorado to Hawaii to uh, uh, Rhode Island, all across the country and many places in between. Uh, these lawsuits have been filed. And as Joy mentioned, there are different legal theories that are being brought in, in these cases. The primary legal theory that's been floated has been public nuisance and other common law tort theories. Um, and they're advancing on, on the premise that they're looking to the fossil fuel industry as the, the manufacturers of a product that they put into the stream of commerce and that that product has caused you know, severe damage despite the knowledge that they had about the causes and consequences of climate change. So with that knowledge, they're trying to seek the costs the, of, of infrastructure, whether it's new infra, infrastructure or improved in, infrastructure and other adaptation costs and trying to recover those damages. The fraud suits, the consumer protection suits like Minnesota had brought last week, as well as the District of Columbia, these are premised on consumer protection and other theories, and it really speaks to the denial and the misinformation. But I will say, although these are different legal theories and, and they're advancing in, in different procedural ways, um, you know, the, the narrative is one and the same. The fact is that they knew, they lied, and they should be held accountable for, for what they've done. And so that is the underlying framework and narrative in each and every one of these lawsuits. The first of these cases, and at least in this wave of, of climate litigation and climate liability lawsuits, was filed back in the summer of 2017. So we now have three years of experience of, of seeing how these cases play out. And again, the Minnesota suit is, is unique and distinctive for various reasons that I'll discuss um, in a moment. But I just wanted to say that there is so much value in what has taken place in Minnesota. Uh, this, the tremendous leadership and the legacy that Minnesota has shown in the tobacco litigation, this is really setting a national stage for what's to come. Uh, you know, Minnesota is now one of three attorneys general who has filed suit, and I would imagine that we're going to see more of these suits in, in the very near term. Uh, the idea is that there will be this groundswell of cases that, you know, and the momentum that's building around the country, similar to tobacco, similar to opioid. I mean, we're now seeing 2,000 plus lawsuits in the opioid litigation. And we know that at some point there will be a critical tipping point with climate litigation as well. We don't know what that number will be, but we're going to get there. Uh, so again, you know, hats off to, to Attorney General Ellison and his team for, for pulling this together and, and really creating this historical moment. Um, but I just wanted to touch briefly on what makes this suit so unique. Um, I think Joy and others have pointed out that the defendants, we have two new defendants in the mix here. We now have Coke and the American Petroleum Institute, neither of which have been named in prior lawsuits. And 
they're essentially the architects or you know the authors of of climate denial and so we want to know what they knew and when they knew it and what they did with that information uh, the remedies that the state is seeking are unique we haven't seen any state seeking disgorgement and it, you know it or public education campaigns some of these are very new and novel theories remedies that are being requested and we want to see how far they go uh, the claims are unique. I think you all know better than I do that Minnesota's consumer protection law is one of the most robust and strongest in the, in the nation. Uh, so I think there's a tremendous body of law to work with and, and that's very favorable to the state. Uh, and just lastly, and, and possibly most importantly, I think the focus of the complaint and the language that, that the Attorney General used in uh, focusing on the disproportionate impacts on low-income communities and people of color, I think that can't be, you know, overstated. Um, that's really unique, and we haven't seen that elsewhere in in these lawsuits up until last week with the filing of Minnesota and DC's complaints. So I feel like not only are the lawsuits evolving and developing, the language and the rhetoric behind them is evolving as well. And I think that's so powerful and exciting to see. Uh, so. Thank you again, and, and now I think I'll turn it back to, to Joy for questions. All right, thanks so much, everyone. All those presentations were really informative and helpful and interesting. So if you have any questions for any of the panelists, you can direct it to a specific person or just throw it out there and we'll see who answers. Um, please enter them into the chat box. So we have one, our first question. As was stated by Ms. Hamilton, since the middle of the 20th century, there has been very significant increases of precipitation across Minnesota, resulting in very significant damages to our ecosystem and, our, and to our citizens. Upstream flooding must go somewhere and the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers carry this flood water downstream, ending up in the Gulf of Mexico. Not only is this flooding and sedimentation a violation of the Federal Clean Water Act, but also a violation of state clean water laws. How does this lawsuit address these violations? Anyone want to take that one? Want me to jump in? Uh, so this lawsuit does not specifically address those violations. This lawsuit is really about the deception um, that the oil companies have caused. And so a lot of what part of what the damages that are being asked for is for restitution for climate change effects. And so if we get to that point, there will certainly be discussion of what effects climate change is having in Minnesota. But this is this lawsuit is not directed at that specific problem. Okay, next question. Assuming there is a discrete list of damages in the suit, is there a mechanism for new damages that come up? I guess that's sort of a, a law question again. Um, so the attorney general asked for restitution generally and a different there's a list of different damages you are not limited to the damages that you specifically list in the complaint as the lawsuit goes forward there will be discovery during which the parties will get more information about what the effects of climate change are and what the um what the oil companies knew and what will have to be the attorney general have to prove those up at trial. And so you're not limited to just what's in the complaint. Once you get to trial, after you've had all this information disclosed, that's when you will, that's when the attorney general will have to prove the damages. And even if there are new ones that aren't included in the complaint, that is okay. Okay, next question. How can environmental and other related nonprofits support this process? Maybe that's one for Jay. Yes, and in the chat box, we have included all the websites of every organization on this, on this call. They are rooting out information to you now, um, and you can support those organizations and others in Minnesota. Thank you. And I would add, to what Jay has offered that I think that, so I, I appreciate the question, Kyle, and I think that nonprofits should begin to um, do what I did on this call and imagine 
um, how we might collaborate for uh, putting all of our resources and creative energies to task to mutually create a just transition strategy. So I think that nonprofits need to begin to have that dialogue with each other now, and it's already been happening, but I think we need to escalate the level of, of creative investment we're making in that so that we are ready for this. And I think that we also ought to begin maybe seeding a uh, climate reparations trust fund ourselves through nonprofits and all of us begin to take 5% of the revenue we get into our organizations and put it into this trust to support the designs we collaboratively uh, figure out. Thanks. Okay, next question. Is there any place we can donate to in order to support this lawsuit? I imagine it will still be very costly even with a government's funding. Is the ACLU involved in any way? Panel? Well, I, I think it should be mentioned that uh, the legal bills will be absolutely massive, uh, but uh, I think private law firms will uh, be assisting the Attorney General uh, in the development of the case and will be doing it on contingency, uh, hoping you know, to win the case and have uh, costs recovered at the end. I, I don't know if that's you know, this this basically cannot be funded entirely by government nor by philanthropy. So there's a lot of private sector, uh, uh, private law firm uh, appetite for participating with the AG as a partner. So, um, you know, I think if people want to donate to the organizations they're connected to or that they appreciate, uh, they the dollars will not typically be going to the legal fees. They'll be going to supporting the attorney general, as uh, Sam has highlighted, you know, building the public will for a just transition uh, for uh, dollars uh, when the lawsuit is is won. Uh, you know, helping to amplify the messages that uh, you know the basic message of the story is that uh, these companies are the architects of climate denial and they're being held accountable by the state of Minnesota. That that narrative has to get out there and start to click in the mind of the public. Uh, you know, we have polling data says the public supports us on this, but um, that's that's where charitable contributions will go. And, you know, a lot of the groups on the uh, call here and three or four other groups in Minnesota are being supported by the Center for Climate Integrity uh, for their uh, local um, voice and their local support. But it, it, it is a modest, modest, modest amount of private philanthropy in this conversation right now. and. Uh, generosity of people on this call is welcomed by all the groups who are who are working on it. Thank you. So next question, can other state AGs sign on or file their own suits? Maybe we'll throw that one to Alyssa. Sure. Um, absolutely. Um, I, I wouldn't uh, say that, you know, the AGs could sign on to this lawsuit because it's very particular to Minnesota and uh, to the fraud and deception that that has that Minnesotan consumers ha have experienced, um, but they could absolutely file their own complaints in their own states under their own state consumer protection laws. Uh, D.C., Massachusetts, and now Minnesota have all filed suit. Rhode Island has filed under a different legal theory. So, absolutely. Okay. Next question. Do taxpayer subsidies play into the lawsuit? Is there governmental responsibility to listen to independent scientists' warnings on climate change? I'm not sure I know what that second part means. Um, as was just discussed, the lawsuit is being brought by the Attorney General and the Attorney General's salary is paid by the state, by the taxpayers, but there's certainly going to be private um, contributions from other law firms as well. Okay, next question. What is the anticipated timeline for this litigation? And is there potential to disincentivize the line three replacement? Um, I can talk about the timeline for the litigation part. And the short answer to that is a long time, but we don't know how long. Um, it's very likely that the oil companies will bring motions right away, motions to dismiss, motions to get this moved to federal court. And so they are gonna to wanna to drag this out as long as possible. So I would anticipate at least several year timeline um, 
I think it was mentioned earlier that the tobacco litigation was four years and that didn't even go to trial, that settled. So I would expect multiple years. Can someone else answer the line three question? One part of the answer is that we're certainly talking to the Attorney General's office about the relationship between this lawsuit and line three, and we're trying to draw a tight um, you know, intersection so that this work also helps us fight um, the, you know, the, uh, the, to help us block uh, pipelines here in Minnesota, including line three. Moving on, next question. Regarding the reference to how Minnesota's consumer protection statutes are particularly robust, what specifically makes them unique to make this sort of litigation stronger here? Again, I think that's a attorney question, so unless someone wants to jump in. So I, uh, before I came to MCEA, I was a, a attorney in private practice, and I have had the opportunity to defend against lawsuits brought by the AG using these statutes. And I can tell you that that is not a great experience. Um, the statutes don't require all the, so when you bring a fraud claim, just a regular fraud claim that you would bring against someone that lied to you about something else in your life, there are a lot of extra elements you have to prove. And here, a lot of these things are stripped away. Some of the intent is lower. Um, the, some of the pleading requirements are lower. There's a lot of different sort of technical things that you don't have to prove with these statutes. Also, the remedies that you can get are much broader. The things that I was talking about, the injunction, the, um, the attorney fees, the uh, civil penalties, those are all things that you can't get in a regular fraud litigation that you can get in using these statutes. And that gives defendants a really large incentive to settle because you don't want to be racking up these attorney's fees. You don't want to be racking up these civil penalties. Next question. Would a new attorney general be required to continue the suit if Ellison isn't reelected in 2022? It seems very possible that Exxon, Coke, API, and, um, and Republicans in general would throw resources into electing a friendly attorney general in 2022. Who wants to take that one? I mean, I, I certainly can't speak to Minnesota politics around this, but um, I can say that, you know, this is very dependent on, on AG support and a new AG could certainly, you know, identify this as a much lower priority or not a priority at all. Uh, you know, so it could look fundamentally different. So I would certainly think that this is something to have on your radar. And uh, I would just add that, of course, the Attorney General understands that uh, uh, there's politics involved in, in uh, taking this very public stance. But I think he's also very confident that he's doing the right thing, both morally and legally and politically. I don't think he's troubled or wondering or confused about whether this is the right thing to do. Um, if you see, saw him speak on television on the subject or at the press conference, you could see he has a very high level of confidence that this is the right thing to do. And, you know, every, every politician's job is to do the right thing and try to figure out how to get elected at the same time, reelected at the same time. So I, I don't think Attorney General Ellison is different than that. But um, we have a very strong polling data that shows that a uh, broad range of uh, Democrats and independents and Republicans would support uh, a, a politician who uh, takes the burden off taxpayers by putting the burden back on the polluters. If the polluters cause the damages and polluters cause the problems, why should taxpayers have to pay for it? And Keith has stood up for all of us with putting this lawsuit forward. So it's incumbent on all Minnesotans who recognize the importance of this to stand with him and make sure that this lawsuit continues. So I think that we have to make sure that a target cannot successfully be put on him uh, because he has, he's done great service to the state. Next question. Could these charges potentially be levied toward politicians who have repeatedly blocked or otherwise inhibited bills to mitigate climate change when they've had access to knowledge of the ramifications of climate change.
I can I can jump in on this one. I feel like I've been talking a lot, so I'm trying to make sure that I give people, other people a chance to say something. Um, so this is based specifically on the oil companies and what they knew and the studies that they had done, the science that they had that told them that there is a consensus about climate change, that it is happening, and um, that they sold products based on those on those on those statements. So the issue with bringing these same kinds of claims against politicians is that these statements that the politicians make are not in connection with sales of products. And so that makes them different. And so you can't use the consumer protection kinds of lawsuits against the politicians. Anyone else want to chime in there? Okay, next question. Is the, state is the state legislature increasing funding to the Attorney General's office for additional staffing? Oh, Michael, you're muted. Can, can someone unmute Michael? I, I uh, put myself on mute, but the, uh, the host has to unmute me. I'm trying to save you from the neighbor's dog. Uh, I think the short answer is, that, you know, right now we're uh, in a, a difficult time legislatively. Uh, the legislature has to meet every 30 days uh, in special session while the governor retains his uh, 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 special powers authority. The constitution or the state law requires that they convene. I don't believe there'll be any discussion of uh, increasing uh, the attorney general's um, revenue or budget as a result of this, at least this legislative session, you know, potentially future legislative sessions. Uh, the attorney general has two full-time energy uh, and environment uh, attorney on staff that uh, are managing this. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, the attorney general is definitely gonna need outside counsel uh, to uh, do some of the heavy lifting uh, uh, as this lawsuit proceeds. So uh, I think the Attorney General is planning on um, litigating this you know, contest with the budget that he has. Although uh, like uh, any public official, he probably appreciate a, a, a better budget. So I, I don't think uh, uh, anything is contingent on uh, the state legislature uh, awarding a more budget authority to the Attorney General's office. Next question. Are other parties like local governments able to sign on to the lawsuit? Again, I think, again, I think it's a lawyer question. Um, the consumer protection statute specifically authorized the state attorney general to bring these claims. So I'm not saying that it's not possible for local governments to sign on. There certainly might be a way for that to happen, but these consumer fraud claims are specifically need to be brought by the AG's office. Next comment, it would be incredible to get municipalities involved and in backing this. St. Paul itself is already being hit hard by the effects of climate change. I imagine we could potentially get the city council interested in throwing their hats into the ring. That's sort of more of a comment, but any panel, anyone that wants to add to that? Um, just to say that I think, you know, there could be parallel efforts going on. There certainly could be lawsuits brought by municipalities and then others brought by the state. Um, we haven't seen that play out yet um, in other states, but I think we're likely to do so. I mean, for example, in California, there are eight municipalities that have brought lawsuit and we're very interested to see what what you know the California AG uh, whether Becerra will move on this or not um, but they've been looking at and investigating the issue for some time um, so it's it's likely that we will see this play out um, with it happening on multiple multiple levels thank you next is there a possible liability due to shareholders because this fraud could and now has led to such mega lawsuits? And Alyssa, do you wanna talk about the New York lawsuit? Um, 
Sure. I, I mean, there was a, a loss. I'm just looking at the question. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the law. The the New York lawsuit was um, essentially essentially a, a similar lawsuit, but it was brought under an Investor Fraud Protection Act um, rather than consumer fraud. Um, that suit was unsuccessful, but there are other lawsuits in which shareholders have brought suit against Exxon and some of these other uh, you know major fossil fuel companies for their failure to disclose information. Um, about the risks associated with climate change to their investments. Um, these lawsuits are ongoing and it'll be interesting to see. But I think what you're asking is actually something different is whether the, the lawsuit in the Minnesota and other types of lawsuits um, that are seeking to hold these comp companies accountable, whether that would then be passed on uh, to the shareholders. I, I don't think that that's necessarily how it works. Although the shareholder value is certainly gonna go down as as these companies face bankruptcy at the end of the day. So, um, you know, I, th I think there will be an impact to shareholders and they should be watching. Uh, and, and, and there have been a number of shareholder resolutions calling for action by these companies and for them to be forthright and to put forward 1.5 or two, two degree plans. Um, so there, there is sh shareholder advocacy and action from the inside. Um, but it's an interesting question that you pose about whether they would be held liable. I, I, my sense is that the answer is no, but it will play out in other ways. Okay, thanks everyone. We are a little bit over time. Um, one quick last comment, um, follow up to politician question. If it was not about consumer protection, but about lying to the public, would it be possible to charge politicians? What if they took money from the companies to pursue policies or perspectives that denied or ignored climate change. Um, I mean, that's a different lawsuit, but certainly I, I don't want to say that that couldn't be brought, but that is a different lawsuit than what's been brought here, is what I would say to that. Thank you so much, everyone. That is all the time we have. We appreciate you spending your lunch hour with us to hear about this lawsuit. You will be hearing again from all of our organizations, I'm sure, about this lawsuit as it moves forward. Um, I hope that if you have more questions, you can reach out to our organizations, uh, look at the complaint, look at our organizations online for more information. And thank you all so much for your time. Thank you.